the harmony of the gospel. How do you start out a new year? And I mentioned it before, and Brian built on it last week. We're looking at the book of Romans, so I hope you have your Bible open to the book of Romans. It's a good text to look at because we're talking about what we believe is God's people. Our theme is love God and love others. Maybe the best place to start when you think about God is with the book of Romans. And you say, well, it seems like that's a deep book. Maybe it is a deep book. There are a lot of things in it. But so we're, what we're doing is just getting not an overview, but reading through and saying, Paul, what are you trying to say? Paul writes to the church at Rome, but he's never visited the church. He knows some of the people there, but he doesn't know the issues that they're dealing with necessarily. So he gives a broad picture. Now, I just... I just experienced that even as I was studying while we were on our trip, Sundar and I just returned from India, and I told the people that were there, I said, I don't know you personally. So we're talking about preaching, and we're talking about the gospel, uh, not the gospels, but uh, Paul's letter to Timothy and Titus. And so I don't know exactly how to apply it to where you are. Let me tell you what the text is, and let's apply it together. We invited 100 preachers. 128 showed up in this room that would fit 130, and then no women were invited, but 60 women showed up, and so how do you turn them away? They didn't. So we had a crowd in the auditorium and a crowd on the second floor listening. So we would just visit later. We're going to give a report on that next Sunday night, Lord willing, because Sundar wants to talk about I have to tell you this, how you saw the video that Clint Till put together on Sundar and Asha. It was great, and Sarayu. I had the privilege of taking that video to Sundar's mother's apartment, and we watched it together. And I have a picture where she's watching it for the first time. And I'll have to say that was a pretty touching moment because she's very proud of her son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter. And I told them that we loved them very much and he had to translate that to the people that were listening, but he couldn't get through it. And I thought, I couldn't either. I, I'm sorry that I put you through that. But what I'm saying is there are people around the world who still believe this, this book is to be God's message. Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he's talking about this beautiful gospel, the good news and I'd like us to look at the first 15 verses here and just get a picture of what's going on because it's, it's the harmony of the Gospels. I'm not talking about the harmony of the Gospels, not taking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and saying, how can you put that together? There was an early book in the early centuries, the Diatessaron, and what it was was trying to put all of them together and say, this is the real account of all of them put together. It's hard to do that. I would even say it's impossible to do that. They each had a different thought process. But the Gospels are talking about Jesus Christ. In order to talk about Jesus Christ, you need to talk about God. Love God. Love each other. And this harmony is what I, th what I think it's the... Paul is describing the beauty of the purpose of God in full display to an appreciative audience. They wanted to know, who is this man? Paul is writing to them. And so what would you say if, you, if a man is coming and you don't know anything about him and he purports to be an apostle? And you're saying, wait a minute, this is the person that was persecuting Christians and now he is going to be one sent by God on behalf of Jesus Christ. So Paul has a huge responsibility. So he starts at the beginning, and that's what I'd like us to do. He clarifies who he is and why he's writing and what God is doing in the world. I believe that if we individually were convinced that God is at work in the world and he's also at work in my life, we would be more impressed with the gospel and the good news and want to share that with others. I'm convinced of that. I hope I can convince you of that, because Paul is talking about this very issue. Loving God, loving others, and he starts with loving God. He uses, Paul uses some terms that really have to do with harmony. 
And I've really wrestled with this thought. I hope you don't mind. I'm not just trying to take this, this harmony. When everything is working together anywhere, it's beautiful to see. A team working together. An orchestra working together. A family working together. A church working together. And I know that was on Paul's mind because he uses some phraseology that tells me that there's something on that same wavelength. And Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says you need to be like the farmer and you need to be like the soldier and you need to be like an athlete. And he uses that term to say you need to play according to the rules. It's beautiful when people respect the rules and they know where they are, and they're working together to do the very best they can according to the prescribed pathway that's given to them. We notice that now. Football is a big issue right now, and I understand that. I listen to people talk about football. Some care about, if you go to a football game, some people care about the concession stand. That's, do they have good food to eat? Because I'm going to watch them play, but I want something to eat. That's as deep as they get. Other people are saying he's passing or he's running or he's handing off. What is he going to do? That's interesting. And then others are saying, look at what the defense is doing. Look at the setup. And they, they just analyze everything, different depths. But you can see a good team when everyone knows what is taking place and everyone is playing their part. And Paul uses that phraseology in Ephesians chapter 4. Everyone is playing their part. Everyone is taking their task. And, and they're doing it for the growth of the body. So I know there's something about that. Then in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Even if I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I have become like a, like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if you, if you can imagine that, I grew up playing in band ever since sixth grade. So it was, I knew what it was like when you play, you could hear something harmonized. If you just have one note, there is no conflict. But you put two notes together and now they, they need to complement each other. You put three notes together, now you're going to really look at the blend. But you put a symphony together. And I was watching a symphony even early this morning. I had, I had time to kill this morning. I ended up watching just an orchestra on, on whatever channel it was on my computer. Beethoven's Ninth. And I was just listening to that and watching how beautiful the harmony is. Everyone is playing their part in that orchestra. And you could see when the conductor was trying to call for certain parts, he was looking and they would respond. And there was kind of a smile on the face of the conductor when you could see it was happening. And it was just all, he knew exactly what I couldn't help but think, that's God working in all this. I can't see how God is working, but he has orchestrated people and he has gifted them and he's placed them and he is using them. And they play, their, their part may not be long, it may not be loud, but it's there. It's just playing. It's that's the multi-layered harmony of an orchestra. God is doing this with the world. He has a part for us. Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and there's two women, Euodia and, Euodia and Syntyche. I urge them to live in harmony. He knew what it was like when things went well. It's beautiful when it's in harmony. Everyone loves it. Another word for harmony would be unity, living together in unity. And boy, if you're in band and you played the wrong note at the wrong time, it was obvious. That doesn't fit, doesn't fit. And Paul knew what it was like. John uh, does the same thing. The apostle John, when he writes the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, he talks about the seven churches of Asia Minor and to each of those uh, churches, he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Well, does, I, I'm listening to John, I'm thinking, well, does, um, does the Spirit talk to churches today? He did these churches. How would they know? You have to read 
what was written in order to know what the Spirit was saying. I think that's what the Bible is doing for us. Is God talking to the churches? Absolutely, he's talking to us. Is God revealing his will? Absolutely, he is. Well, where do I fit in? Read Romans. Paul is explaining it. And he's explaining in, in words that you might just say, well, I read through, but I didn't get that. Well, I'd like to, I'd like us to do that. Look at Romans chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul says this, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. And, and let me just stop right there. A bondservant of Christ Jesus. If you were to get his message, Paul's going to start out by saying, watch me. I want, you to, I want you to know something about me. A bond servant of Christ Jesus. This is, this is big because he is saying, I've changed. I've changed. He used to be persecutors. He would, he would be the persecutor of, of, of a follower of Jesus. And now he is saying, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. That's a big statement. You and I change. We don't want to change necessarily, but we're going to change. We're going to, we're going to grow older whether we like it or not. Kicking and screaming, we're going to get older. And sometimes we make mistakes in life. And we allow those mistakes to take us into a, a, an area where we, if we're not careful, we'll start thinking, well, I, I'm stuck here now. I can't go back. They wouldn't accept me. I've talked to people who said I can't go back to the church because the mistakes I've made. Yes, you can. There's not a person here who hasn't made mistakes. We're all changing. And Paul says, I've changed. A bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. God is giving this good news which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who is declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. He says he's been called, and then he turns around and says, you've been called too. We have something in common so that we are called by God to come to him on his terms. That's a big change. And who is he writing to? He says, among whom also you are the called of Jesus Christ to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's bringing grace from the Father and the Son. He's bringing greetings from the Father and Son to this church. And he is telling them he's writing to the church. He's not writing to someone who doesn't know about God. He's writing to, as he will later explain in Romans 6, those who have been baptized into Christ. So he, this is not, you don't re pick out something from Romans and say, this is how you come to Christ. He's talking to people who are in Christ. They are saints set apart by the Holy Spirit. I think that's interesting. Paul sees himself as a part of this spiritual family. I think he's a part of our spiritual family too. We're in the same family. He's our brother in Christ, separated by years, separated by distance, but he's in Christ. Next Sunday night, you'll hear Sundar talk about his home in India. I was impressed. I was just floored by just the people. I, my expectations, if, it were, if I was expecting bad things because people said, oh, you'll, you'll face this, this will be, I didn't face any of that. And if it was something that was um, unique, I'd have to pull Sundar and say, now, aside and say, what, what are they talking about there? What are they talking about? I was asked of all things, are you a vegetarian? And they would smile. And all I could think of is I just passed two cows walking down the street, so I can't say too much. And then I've been eating chicken prepared any way you can cook it. And so I don't know how I can say that. What can I say that would not offend them? 
And I just said, no, I'm not a vegetarian. Just confess it. Get it out on the table. They're not either. And that was the whole issue. They were just asking to test me to see what the issue was. Would I eat beef or would I eat whatever? But it's, it's watch me. We're in this together. Now, the next text, look at verse 8. First, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, making a request if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you in order that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, what he is saying is, let's go together. We need to get together, to be together. I want to be with you. Now, Jacob is very honest in saying this morning, it's just good to see anyone. I'm just glad to be around people. And that's true. But it's also we're around God's people. We have something in common. We have Jesus Christ and we're serving him. He's our Lord. He's our master. He's the one that is leading us to God the Father. We're going to be in the presence of God the Father. And so when he's talking about this, he's, he said, I'm thankful your, for your faith. I pray about your faith. Your faith speaks for itself around the world. It's what Paul is saying to the church at Rome. Hadn't been there, but I've heard about your faith. And your faith is being spoken of, now, which is challenging. What would people say about us if he said something about the faith of the Germantown Church of Christ? What would he say? What would he say about my level of participation in the church? Well, the church is strong, but Dave, boy, he has problems. Is that what they would say? Or Dave thinks whatever, whatever. What would they say? Now, Paul was saying that they do. And so what he is that they do have this relationship and he is praying for them and he's joining together in prayer with them. And he is not just praying, I hope the people at Rome do well, he's praying specifically for some things that we ought to be praying for. And he mentions these beginning in verse uh, 13. He says, well, verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged together with you while among you each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. There's mutual encouragement. You want to know the challenge in the church is we're supposed to be encouraging each other. And Paul's talking about that. You can be encouraged by someone. I'll tell you that just to be honest, it's encouraging to see people come out at a different time, maybe outside of your regular realm of uh, your practices just to come to worship. And it's good to worship, isn't it? It's good for us just to pause and sing and be together. Mutual encouragement, both yours and mine. Verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that often I had planned to come to you and have been prevented thus far in order that, here's the second one, I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as, as among the rest of the Gentiles. He wanted to bear fruit. Well, what was that fruit? Well, we can wrestle with that. I think it could mean many different things. It could be additional Christians, more people coming from the Gentile faith, that is, uh, not the Jewish faith, pagans coming to Christ. That would be good. It might be that they're growing in their spiritual gifts, love, joy, peace, patience, that I could learn from you and be encouraged by you. When you visit people who are from a different place, you, you kind of... You've you, you got to sit back and say, I see this and I want to be more like them in this way. It could be growing in their wisdom, as James talks about. James 3, grow in wisdom to know what is right and what's wrong. That's important. And then verse uh, 14, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Thus, for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also. So you have this the gospel of Christ. I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation. There's a divine commitment, this gospel, the good news. God is involved in this. 
He's made some commitments to this. And so I keep reading in the Bible about this God, and that encourages me. And the reason it encourages me is because God has promised us, both with a promise and with an oath, the Hebrew writer would say, a promise and an oath. So we know this is true. God has given this, this, this promise, and the good news is that we can be with him for eternity. Not only that, we can be a part of this, this union, this, this church of his in which we're all working together and we can have a part in that. It might be a small part, but it's a part. Couldn't help. You watch an orchestra play and you can see that someone who's playing just a little, here's a, an oboe or a flute or a clarinet, doesn't really sound loud. You can get the trumpets and you can get the French horns and boy, they have a unique sound and, and each has a different part in telling a story that the author of this this. Uh, composition wants to get across. So it's, a, it's something about everyone playing their part. You can be a part of it. And when you finish, and I noticed when they finished, of course, everyone applauded. But then after it was all over, the musicians were congratulating each other. That was good. That was good. Why was that? Because when you finish something and you do well, you need to take time to just say, that was good. It's the game. After the game, the athletes are giving each other high fives and they're just thanking, and the fans are cheering. Why? Their expectations were met and they can see that. Even the team that lost, they'll go over and say, that was a great game. I was in it for the competition and it was good. So you see all of that taking place in, the, in a family, a family going through difficulties. They make it through the difficult times and then they bow together and they pray and they say, we're thankful that we've had your blessings, Lord, and we've been able to go through those issues and we came out on the other side and isn't that good. And a church goes through cycles and a church goes through moments of growth and sometimes a, a, a time of planting and a time of watering and then a time of harvesting. And when you get to harvesting, you don't say, boy, this is the way it ought to be all the time. You say, you know, there's a season for this and there's also a season for digging and planting and watering because God is working in us. So what we have to do is just join with him. God has a plan for that. So I would say he is, Paul is calling out to the church at Rome and not just the church at Rome. He's calling out to the church to be a part of this. And the last part of that would be God is always our focus. And I think that's what he is saying in verse 14. I'm under obligation. Maybe um, if you watch God at work, you can see it. If you look back and see how God has blessed us and then you dream forward of what God could do, and that slaps you back to reality and what we ought to be doing right now. Right now. And that is getting to work. I hope 2024 is a time when we collectively, and that starts with us individually, start saying, I'm going to work for the Lord and I'm telling you God is my focus. The gospel of God. It's the good news from God. And I love God. I love Jesus Christ, my Savior, my Lord. I'll bow down and serve him, whatever that means. And the Holy Spirit, whom I received when I was baptized into Christ, is working in me. He is strengthening me to do what this text says. And the response is pretty obvious because he says in verse 14, I am indebted. Indebted to who? Indebted to God. God is our focus. But notice, that's not what he says. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I owe the people I'm with. You've been blessed by God with a gift. Now, what's, what's the indebtedness? If you've been blessed with a gift and you have the opportunity to use that gift, you have the responsibility to use that gift. So what are you going to do with it? What am I going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? Paul says, I am indebted. That's an attitude. God is our focus. I am indebted to serve. I am indebted to people, whoever they are. You can't pick and choose the ones you want to serve. You, want to, you can't pick and choose and say, These are, this is my group. You can't do that. We're in God's kingdom. And God is the one who empowers us. Think about that. 
What is the church supposed to do? Well, look at what your giftedness is. Listen to coaches talk. This is great. I enjoy talking or listening to coaches. The, the most recent one was the Alabama coach. What does he say he's going to do? I'm going to look at what we have, our talents, and I'm going to guide the program around our talents. And I said, that is exactly right. You, f you find what the talents are of your athletes and you come up with a system that utilizes that. Who does that in the church? God does. The Bible says we have been gifted. How did we, how were we gifted? The Bible says, I'm just, read Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. These gifts have been distributed just as the Spirit desires. So I think the bottom line, if you jump to the bottom line is, God equips his people to do what God wants his people to do. And so you find out what we're equipped to do and start working on that together. Find someone that can fill in a hole. I need some help. I need some help. I'd like to try. Good. Can you come in here and try? I'm not very good. Well, you'll learn because we're going to learn through this together. I am indebted. And then he says in verse 15, thus for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I am eager. I can't wait to get started. It's a mindset. It's when you wake up in the morning, you say, boy, what another day. You're not very eager. If you wake up in the morning, you say, hey, it's a, it's a sunny day. And, you know, the temperatures are not that bad. This is great. I need to get to service. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. It's a mindset and see what can happen. Uh, this trip is on my mind, so I apologize if I use too many illustrations from it. But boy, we had we had traveled a two hour trying to get back to the States. And we traveled two hours uh, from one place, Rajamundri, all the way to Bangalore. And now it's another 10 hour trip to Amsterdam. Get to Amsterdam. And this is great. Now I'm worn out. We're still worn out. But we got to wait, wait two hours and then get on another plane to make it to Atlanta. We've got to make it all the way back and then go from Atlanta. To... So we get to Amsterdam and they said, well, we're going to have to be de-iced. We're going to have to get in line. Now we have three hours, two and a half, three hours on a plane waiting to get de-iced. And finally we get de-iced, looks good. Get over. And then he says, well, all the pilots, the flight crew has uh, timed out. So this flight's over. We're going back to now we get to go to a hotel if we just had a hotel. So we didn't have a hotel room. So now we're in the Amsterdam lobby on a couch all night long. And I saw the entire world walk by. And I was thinking, this is really interesting. I was so glad I was not bringing a group. It was just Sundar and me. And I just blamed Sundar. That's the way you do it. Sundar, it's your fault. It's your trip. Anyway, we had fun. We learned a lot. It's when we had a cup of coffee late in the, at night and we just had a good talk and ironed out some things that we were dealing with on these issues. I'm eager. You want to go back? Well, I'll tell you, at some point, I didn't think I would want to go back. But then when I got back, I said, you know, this would really be good. We could do some things differently next time. And he had the same thought. Well, what do you want to do in 2024 with the church? I would beg you to be eager to work for the Lord with God as your focus. Pray to God and ask God to open a door and then look for open doors. The third one is, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Don't change the good news in order to get more people. You can't change the promise of God. I'm not ashamed of it. This is God's promise. Well, this is, not, this is how I think the church ought to grow. Well, let's just see what the Bible says. Let's just go back and say, if that is that right? Is what you're saying according to the word? Let's do that. Let's think about this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that just sets up what he's going to talk about, how God thinks. Wow. To me, that's a good place to start. In the Old Testament, there is a phrase, Psalm 133, that says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. To me, that's like saying unity in harmony. Listen, it's, it's, not, it's just beautiful to watch. You can see, watch the games. If you don't watch, if you don't like games, you don't have to listen for a while to someone say, they're doing this beautifully. Watch this. 
Here's this man, and they're working in harmony. It's beautiful to see when it happened. When a plan comes to fruition, it's good to see it happen. Or it might be listening to music. It might be the church. It might be your family. It might be two people coming together. It's like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. When they would anoint someone, they would pour this oil on their head and it would just start dripping down. He's trying to, it's trying, when it's coming down in that case, it's a beautiful thing to know because of what it represents. It comes down over his beard. It comes down over his robe and it's going all down. And it's that coming down that is beautiful to see. That's different from other places. In fact, the psalmist says, it's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. And that's different from David when he's running from Saul and they're catching up with him and he gets in the army of the enemy and he starts acting like a madman. Just read about David. What he does, he starts foaming at the mouth. He starts just uh, acting like a madman and his his saliva comes down and he's is dripping on his beard and they think he's a crazy man. He must be a crazy man. That can't be David. That can't be the one that's a man of God who's slain his thousands. He can't even control himself. Well, that's one thing when that happens. But boy, when people are working together in unity, it's like that you see the blessing of God. The blessing of God is when we're serving him and we feel indebted to people who need the help that we've been blessed with to have, to, to be able to give, and we're eager to do it, and we're not ashamed. We serve God. We serve Him, and it's wonderful to serve together. So I would say, as we look at this year, love God and love others. Let's follow Paul as he unfolds God's plan for all of mankind, but it's an attitude. It starts with an attitude. It's what we're doing in Germantown, in the year 2024, it's the way in which God can work through us. If you're not in the kingdom and you want to be in the kingdom, we want to help you do that. And if you don't know how, we'll be glad to explain it to you. A person hears the word, believes it, repents of his sins, confesses Jesus as Lord. He's buried with his Lord in baptism. He's added to the body of Christ. He receives the forgiveness of sins. He receives the gift of the Spirit. And he now stands before God justified because of his obedience and God's faithfulness to his promise.